Uh, good morning, everyone. Hi, good morning. <laughs> so uh, it's six minutes uh, past the hour. So I guess it would be it would be good if we could uh, begin. So I invite you to take your seats. So uh, welcome to this workshop on uh, public policies to deploy IPv6 in developing countries and uh, the successful international experiences, which has been uh, organized, co-organized by uh, Mexico, by the IFT and uh, LACNIC. Uh, we thank our organizers for hosting us. And uh, the speakers for this session will be uh, Tania, Ta Tania Villa Trapala from the Col Telecommunications Institute in Mexico. Uh, Valentina Schialpi uh, from uh, Next Generation Internet European Commission, uh, Rosa Delgado, Chair of the IPv6 Council in, uh, in Peru, uh, Paul Wilson from APNIC, Laura Kaplan from LACNIC, Carolina Aguerre from uh, uh, University of Santiago and UBA in Buenos Aires, and Rajesh Charia, the President of the ISPAI in India, and the Director of the NICSI, the National Internet Exchange of India. So uh, the idea of this session is to listen from our uh, speakers on successful cases of IPv6 deployment in uh, developing countries and how public policies have uh, fostered this deployment and uh, to learn a little bit about uh, where public policy is going into uh, expanding IPv6 adoption. Uh, we, we will try to make this as interactive as possible. We are aware that you might have already been in too many workshops uh, so far, and uh, we don't want to make this a monologue. Instead, we want this to be a dialogue and to be constructive about it. So uh, what we propose is that we uh, listen to our speakers in a first intervention and uh, after that, uh, we suggest that we break up in groups to discuss four uh, main topics, uh, which I will, I, I, I will uh, enumerate uh, in, as the main pillars of I IoT development, uh, the importance of IPv6 deployment for the proper development for IoT. These two uh, topics will be uh, treated in one subgroup. And then the successful experiences for IPv6 deployment and the future of IPv4 addresses that, sh that will be uh, dealt with in another subgroup. So uh, the objective of breaking into subgroups is of course to foster the discussion between uh, the audience and uh, the speakers and try to reach uh, some uh, conclusions on the discussions to then share with the uh, wider audience and of course to document this output uh, from our workshop. So uh, I would now like to uh, handle the floor to uh, Tania Villa Trapala from uh, the Telecommunications Institute in Mexico to share with us uh, her uh, thoughts on how public policies might aid to deploy IPv6. So Tania, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, so I come from the IFT, which is a telecommunications and broadcasting uh, regulator in Mexico. And I just want to briefly talk to you about our experience with IPv6 deployment and what is happening in, in our country. So first of all, we needed to understand what was the status of IPv6 in Mexico. And uh, by the beginning of this year, we had less than 1% of IPv6 traffic in, in our country. This was a concern for us. So what we did first was to issue a questionnaire. At the, it was published at the IFT website. And we wanted to understand what were the main reasons for, for this uh, such a 1% uh, um, traffic. It's nothing. So uh, the, que the questionnaire was intended to be fulfilled by, by the ISPs, but also by the academia, by civil organizations, and the public in general. And so to make sure that we received all answers, we made it compulsory for the ISPs to, to answer to the questionnaire. 
after this exercise, we were amazed at the conclusion because we often thought that the reason of not adopting IPv6 was, was some uh, technicality, like maybe uh, the lack of compatibility with IPv4 or something like this. But what we found out is that most of the time people don't know the, the advantages or the benefits of IPv6. And this uh, lack of knowledge, is, it's not coming from the public in general. It's coming even from the small or medium ISPs. Uh, so then, uh, from the regulation perspective, we also in Mexico have a very special case. Uh, there's one big player that has like more than 60% of the market. I'm not going to name them, but I guess you can, you can guess who it is. <laughs> so um, this player had not uh, connected to the IXP in Mexico. In Mexico, we have only one IXP. So we made it mandatory for this big player to connect to the IXP and also to accept IPv6 connections. Uh, this happened in July this year. In November, so last month, the IFT has published the minimum technical requirements for interconnection between telecommunication networks. And it is mandatory that within four years, all interconnections should be using IP technology and IPv6 is mandatory. So um, lastly, to tackle the problem of the lack of information, in the following weeks, we will be launching a microsite, which is a, an individual web page within the IFT website that will include information about IPv6, training material, um, also the tools to communicate with final users to answer the, their questions, and also that uh, we will publish a best practices manual and this is uh, intended also for other government institutions that are trying to transition to IPv6. And also, whenever the government wants to purchase IT systems or equipment, uh, we propose that it's mandatory that it should require IPv6 connection. So all in all, this, uh, we know that regulation alone will not uh, solve the problem, but uh, we also know that the, the development of professional skills is very important. And uh, it's not, uh, we have been seeing an increase in IPv6 traffic. Last um, week, we had already 5% of IPv6 traffic. I know it's maybe not that much, but uh, remember, it's five times what we had six months ago. So thank you. Thank you very much, Tania. So uh, in, uh, what I take from uh, what you've just told us is that in some way uh, the Telecommunications Institute in Mexico is hoping that uh, by making it mandatory for uh, the dominant player in the market to adopt IPv6 and by uh, uh, requiring the government to uh, acquire equipment that is IPv6 ready, then uh, hopefully the deployment of IPv6 will actually grow, is that, is that right? Yeah, because uh, whatever the, the biggest ISP does, it will highly reflect on the whole market because it's more than 60% of the, of the users. And uh, we think that also with uh, this player being in the IXP, it will foster the development of more IXP networks points because uh, we we talked to the people that are managing the IXP in Mexico. It's a non-profit organization. And they were telling us they want to open more IXPs, but if the biggest ISP is not there, the others don't want to come. <laughs> because in the end, they want to connect with uh, the biggest network. So yes, uh, we are hoping it will foster the, the deployment. Thank you very much, uh, Tania. I would now uh, like to give the floor to Valentina Shalpi. And uh, Valentina, the floor is yours. I, I'm really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, next I have Rosa Delgado. So uh, Rosa, would you like to share your thoughts <coughs> on uh, the Peruvian experience on IPv6 deployment? Mm -hmm. Hello, yes. Yes, uh, well, before everything, thank you very much for the invitation, and uh, I'm really very pleased here. Um, I just uh, wanted to tell you a bit the story about Peru, because um, 
and for different for about a year, year and a half, Peru was really at the start of IPv6, and uh, I think it was uh, something very, um, uh, very important for Peru in the case that today in the academia, in the uh, universities, in the private sector, even government people knows what is IPv6, but <coughs> I think it stops about that, but at least they know, they know that probably some benefits will come with it. Uh, what happened in, in Peru, it was that in uh, year 2009, Telefonica of Peru realized that they didn't have more addresses, IPv4 addresses for, for Peru by 2012. No more addresses at all. So, well, they, they were deciding what to do because they had three years to go. <clears throat> and at that moment, uh, Telefonica of uh, Madrid was looking for a country where to start um, a, from a scratch, a country. I mean, Telefonica, the majority of uh, operators, even in 2011, 2012, um, didn't know how to move a full country, a full region into IPv6. And I think uh, Telefonica, they needed that. They need a, a test bed. Um, Peru was chosen. Uh, at that moment, um, they start to do the project, and uh, what Telefonica did, it was not to, go, not to uh, pass some users to IPv6. He passed the whole number of users of Lima. Lima was almost, uh, um, for Telefonica, almost in IPv6, all, all, the, all the users of Telefonica. So what happened at that moment is that all of the people, the users, start to, to create the traffic um, in the IPv6, and everybody was saying, what happened with Peru? I mean, it's, it was even on the fifth place in the, in the war at that time. And um, every, everybody was very surprised, including Telefonica, I must tell you. <clears throat> so that was a good point for us at that moment because that has made push maybe governments and uh, uh, especially private sector to think a bit more about uh, how important is ICT for, for companies, for the government. I must tell you, there's not much movement, but uh, uh, in this year, in 2017, the government decided to put a law what the, the, all the offices of the state, state offices will move to IPv6, will start to move by 2018. So some things are happening, and I think it was very good for us. Um, but also I wanted to share with you that countries like Ecuador, like Bolivia, suddenly they were first in the list on IPv6 traffic. Um, countries like they never been before the first on technologies. So I think it's been <coughs> moving sometime in the countries in the Pacific, which more or less the, the traffic or the, the, um, the innovation was on the Atlantic side with Uruguay, Argentina, Brazil. This time there was a really a shake on the Pacific, and that for me has been very, very good. But uh, anyway, uh, I think uh, we're still there. Um, what I find the problems, in, I don't know if they were, will be about the barriers, but I can tell you the barriers in Peru are, again, like in most countries, uh, capacity building. Um, we're trying to build up um, workshops, uh, events, of, uh, um, but I think one of the main problems I find, at least in Peru, is that the main um, staff, the management staff in the government, in the academia, and in the private sector, do not know what's IPv6, and do they know how they can really take benefit of that. And I, I think for the moment, we are trying with universities for uh, starting in 2018, uh, start to make uh, um, workshops or even courses about uh, top level management of private sector, academia, and the state to tell them, to explain them how they can benefit from IPv6. For us, the problem is not to move anymore to IPv6. We are there, but we're not using very much. So I think it's, that's what I wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rosa. Uh, it's, this is a, <coughs> uh, a different experience from what I've heard from Mexico. It seems to me that while Mexico is trying to uh, make mandatory deployment of IPv6, then the counterpart in Peru seems to have been adopting IPv6 uh, by the rules of the market as the, the main player, the mobile player, which I believe is uh, one of the uh, boosters to this end. Uh, 
uh, deployed or, or, or made Peru a, a pilot project for IPv6 deployment. So it's very interesting to see how uh, both uh, models uh, may play uh, differently and uh, with, of course, different challenges and different uh, rates of success. So now I would like to uh, hand the floor to Paul Wilson uh, to share with us uh, some thoughts and experiences on, on IPv6 deployment. Thank you, uh, Leon. I'm Paul Wilson from APNIC. We're the IP address registry for the Asia Pacific, so we're responsible for managing uh, IP addresses V4 and V6 around uh, that part of the world, along with um, four other regional internet registries that operate today. So we've been uh, allocating uh, V6 addresses and supporting V6 use by our members for many, many years now, and we've been talking about it for many, many years, including here in, in uh, the IGF, and I, I guess it doesn't need to be uh, argued anymore that IPv6 actually is um, is a necessity eventually for the growth of the internet, um, whether it's the, the so-called IoT, which is actually just um, the internet, or traditional growth of the internet through the normal deployment through through cable and and mobile uh, usage. It's growing it's growing rapidly. It'll keep on growing rapidly, um, and it'll keep going for many many years. It, it really doesn't need to be argued, I hope, anymore, just on the basis of the numbers that 4 billion addresses available in IPv4 is just simply not, av not enough to allow the internet to keep growing uh, the way it was designed to be, um, to be built in the, in the first place. Um, if we go back a couple of years, there were genuine debates going on about whether IPv6 would succeed at all because it really had been sort of bumping along the bottom <laughs> for, uh, for many years. We'd, we'd, we'd been talking about... Um, about IPv6 for well over a decade and the, the deployment wasn't happening. But I'm glad to say that's, that those debates are, are actually over now, um, undoubtedly. Uh, for the last couple of years, there's been a very healthy e exponential growth, which has brought us now to about 15% of all users in the world having IPv6 capability. So that's, that's a huge number of users um, using the internet on a daily basis, using IPv6, close to a billion uh, users. Uh, at, the, at the content end, uh, Google was one of the drivers. They've hit 20% of their traffic being delivered over IPv6, which again is a vast, a vast amount of traffic. So no one can uh, can doubt uh, anymore that IPv6 is is um, is here uh, to stay um, because these these changes are very are very rapid and they seem to be um, se they seem to be continuing. Um, I'm uh, often asked about what is the role and the and the future of of IPv4 um, because of course IPv4 is all over the internet. In fact, you still these days cannot cannot connect to the internet um, in a in a full way without having access to IPv4 addresses at, from your from your endpoint because there's a lot of content and services which are available only on on IPv4. And so the IPv4 internet is also continuing to grow because, uh, because the internet grows and, uh, and V6 is being deployed, but many providers, for all sorts of reasons, are continuing to use, to use IPv4. And the fact that the addresses are almost exhausted sort of raises the question about where the address space is coming from for, um, for fueling the, the IPv4 internet growth. And, and basically, there's, there's a, a couple of sources of addresses. You either have... Uh, from your local internet address registry, you have availability of a very small pr uh, amount of IPv4 address space for, for every network that needs it. And we make that available because, as I say, v4 is still absolutely essential uh, for con connectivity to the internet. But the way that v4 address space needs to be used is through network address translation, which is the technology that allows one address to be shared by potentially thousands and thousands of, of users. And that's exactly the, the sort of downside of, of continuing the IPv4 internet is the fact that you're using network address translators sometimes in two layers that uh, takes, your, takes your packets from the internet, um, translates them through a couple of, at uh, up to a couple of stages of, of intermediary address space. And, uh, and that all happens, has to happen in real time in the course of, of every connection and every packet that flows on, on the net. We've got another another um, uh, session later this morning, actually, about about carrier grade NAT and network address translation. So I won't I won't go on about that here, except to say that it's a, a huge cost impost and a huge efficiency impost on the internet. So that that in itself provides a great incentive to be using IPv6, but it doesn't sort of prevent the the need for for IPv4 while. IPv4 is still in use on the internet. So the other the other way that you can you can get more substantial amounts of IPv4 address space is now on an open market. So it is possible in uh, much of the world to uh, 
if you need IPv4 address space, then if you can, can find a, a consenting donor, you can make an arrangement to, to purchase address space and have, the, have that, um, that transfer of address space properly registered in the, in the RIR databases, which is an, es is an essential part of, of using that, that address space. So there is a market. Uh, it's, it's not a very transparent market. It's hard to say what's going on out there, but uh, the sort of average benchmark figure as a price for an IPv4 address is about $10 per address. And that's, um, that's uh, a, actually a relatively small amount in, uh, in terms of uh, the per user uh, use of that address space because uh, an ISP might actually assign that address space, that, that address permanently to a user and, and earn about $10 a month from that address, uh, as a, which against a $10 purchase price is pretty good. Or they might take that address and share it amongst thousands of users at, at effectively a cost of less than a cent per user, uh, again, for a $10, a $10 um, cost. But you don't buy in individual IPv4 addresses individually. You, you buy them as an ISP, or you need them as an ISP in large amount, in large blocks. And so a very large ISP, for instance, that might need what we'd call a slash eight, a large block of addresses of, of 16 million addresses, that, that kind of amount of address space is worth $160 million. So it becomes, that becomes a much different prospect in terms of where that financing is, is coming from. So we're not seeing a huge amount of movement of IPv4 addresses in this, in this way. And that's, and that's okay because the, uh, the alternative to all of this is, is to get moving on IPv6 and, uh, and that's exactly what uh, what ISPs are doing, weighing up all of the, the both the technical and the financial aspects of, uh, of V6 transition and deployment and making decisions uh, in their own way, in their own time to, to deploy uh, addresses. And, and as we've heard, it could, it could be happening on a city, a city basis, it could be happening on a service basis. The most, uh, the most successful um, examples that we see are what we call greenfield deployments, because if you, if you don't have an existing network, if you want to build a new service, then IPv6 is available and it's, uh, and it's possible to do that. And probably the, the best example that we have of that at the moment, which has shot India into the second place globally in terms of percentage deployment and the first place in terms of the number of users, uh, that's, the, that's the case of Reliance Geo in India and I guess Rajesh might, might have a bit, to, a bit to say about that because it's, it's really the, the leading and best example out of many actually of, uh, of a successful industry IPv6 deployment these days. But I've probably said enough, so thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Paul, for these uh, very interesting points. And uh, I, I take from uh, from what you said that uh, we have challenges ahead by uh, IPv IPv4 exhaustion. The pool has has uh, depleted, and of course uh, the network address translation as a downside of, of these uh, of this exhaustion. And of course, uh, what you said, IPv6 is here to stay. So uh, I would like to uh, give the floor to Laura Kaplan from LACNIC to uh, share her experience and thoughts with us. So Laura, you have the floor. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, there. Uh, my name is Laura Kaplan. I'm from LACNIC, that is the RIR uh, that allocates resources for Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, I'm not going to speak about a specific case, um, and I don't want to repeat uh, what Paul just explained, that is that IPv6 is, uh, is here, is now. Um, the RIRs have been working in promoting the need uh, to deploy IPv6 for the past more than 10 years. We are working in this together uh, as a group. Uh, promoting uh, not, not only the need, but also benefits that comes uh, uh, with the, the, um, the deployment of IPv6. Um, I'm, I would like to speak a little bit about the, um, the role that uh, the governments can have, uh, the importance of uh, pushing the, the licitation on to buy uh, equipment <laughs> Uh, that are, um, are, are available to connect uh, not only IPv4 but also IPv6. Uh, we have the danger in, the, in our region in Latin America and the Caribbean to get uh, stuck with uh, equipment or st uh, still 
uh, investing equipment that are not IPv6 ready. Um, and we are now, for our region, between 40 and 60 percent of, of, of deployment. So imagine we have uh, not only a lot more uh, to grow in, in, in which is uh, the um, connecting devices, but also more than 40 percent of our population. So the need to grow is, is, is really huge. Um, also, from uh, the RIRs, we uh, push the, um, the, um, the model of uh, mul a multi-stakeholder um, way of working. So there, there is not only one uh, actor that, that should uh, take care of this. We believe that there is, uh, th 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 there is a whole um, sectors that are involved, uh, ISPs, academy, uh, governments, uh, also the technical community. As our colleagues from Mexico and Peru, uh, we are also very engaged in uh, capacity building. Um, and the fact that we were promoting this for the last 10 years was not enough uh, to get uh, the message that the IPv6 is, uh, the, the transition to IPv6 is the real solution and, and is the sustainable solution. Uh, also, it's very important to um, to work with the, not, not only the, the, the engineers or the technical that are related uh, daily to, to this use, but also uh, the people that are taking the decisions of investment in the companies. So uh, capacity building is, is not always just to understand how to use uh, or to turn to IPv6, but also to get the people that take that decision to make the transition uh, about the benefits. Uh, and there's a lot of benefits. Uh, the, for example, the, the, the one, the, 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 the main benefit is, is that it's going to be the sustainable solution um, for, for getting, uh, con for, for getting the, the, the population that is not connected uh, in the internet and also to, to keep, um, uh, to uh, accomplish the, the use of many more uh, devices that uh, the IoT is, 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 is now um, in the need. Uh, so I, I wanted to talk about um, the trustability, for example, that is also a, a benefit, uh, is safer, uh, you can um, it, it, it's, it's easier to to, to, to um, um, follow and to sustain a, 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 the, the um, assignment of, of, the, of these resources. Uh, so, and the, and, and, and the thing that uh, the, the all sectors are connected and are working in the same way, uh, is important to, to get all uh, on board. Uh, all the, n not, not just as a country or as a government, but as, as a different multi-stakeholder group. So that's what I wanted to emphasize. Um, and I give the floor to the next one. Thank you very much, uh, Laura, for uh, your intervention. What I take from it is that uh, you see uh, government or LACNIC sees uh, government as a key player in, uh, in, in deployment as a wide adoption by governments of IPv6 equipment could actually boost uh, IPv6 deployment and also uh, that one incentive that uh, public policy could be looking at is that uh, the more IPv6 we deploy, uh, more population that is not yet connected could have actually uh, access to the internet. Uh, I, I, I would like you to expand a little bit on uh, a, a topic that you touched, that's transferability of resources. Uh, you said that it was uh, safer. And, uh, uh, would, would you mind expanding a little bit on this idea of uh, why you see this as positive? Uh, as you know, the RIRs are the ones that um, 
and responsible for allocation of resources. So in the situation that we are having now with IPv4, um, it's, 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 it's getting um, the, 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 the bad use of IPv4 uh, is, is not the way to go and turning to IPv6 is a more complete uh, and is a more um, uh, sustainable way to for the IRRs to really um, uh, keep um, keep the, the 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 register um, working as as it has to be, um, and th this is is going to uh, resolve a lot of, of problems of connectivity that we are maybe uh, reaching now. Uh, so that's why traceability is, is one of uh, the big six uh, benefits. Thank you very much, uh, Laura, for, for expanding on that. Uh, now I would like to uh, give the floor to Carolina Aguirre uh, to share some thoughts with us on the same topic. Carolina? Thank you, Leon, and thank you, uh, thank you, the organizers. I would like to thank the organizers for setting up uh, this panel uh, and for uh, inviting me. Um, Firstly, I mean, the, this, uh, this panel is about I IPv6 and, and, uh, and IoT. And um, Paul just mentioned, I mean, that uh, the uh, IoT is just the internet, and, and I totally agree. But, uh, but what we have here is uh, IoT becoming uh, a big driver. I mean, connecting objects to the internet, becoming like a major driver, a major uh, incentive uh, to deploy uh, and develop IPv6. Um, and we've just heard uh, very interesting uh, experiences in, in different regions and, and two Latin American countries on, on the major uh, kind of incentives uh, that uh, governments uh, have learned uh, in the last years on what they need, I mean, the, the, the major incentives that they need to promote uh, in their environment in order to, uh, for IPv6 to, to be uh, deployed. And, and continuing with, uh, with Laura's um, intervention, my... Um, intervention in, in this panel is, is briefly concentrated in, in also in looking at, at the role of governments um, in, in the expansion of, um, of IoT and IPv6 together. And one, one of the uh, first uh, issues I would like to raise is um, something that has been considered uh, in, in, in the literature and, and the uh, best practices around the world recently <coughs> is uh, the role that, for example, the German government took in developing the whole industrial complex around, around I o IOT and artificial intelligence with the industry uh, industry uh, 4.0 uh, as a major concept where all the uh, industries uh, the from the traditional sector are interconnected with uh, this new um, with with IPv6 and and and, the, and technologies that will uh, interconnect uh, uh, objects and uh, promote the, the use of artificial intelligence. So uh, here uh, we have a, an, a very interesting uh, role of, of governments in envisioning what kind of. Uh, um, in, in promoting the vision they have for their productive sector where the uh, development of the internet and the ICTs and interconnectivity is completely related with the future uh, economic growth uh, of any country and, and their in industries, be they traditional or be they uh, coming from uh, the, the ICT sector. The other thing is uh, w that we that we see is uh, that uh, governments also play a major role as uh, agenda setters. So, so if governments don't buy in and don't promote uh, the, the the relevance of of IPv6 uh, uh, to enable uh, IoT deployment, to enable smart cities, for example, uh, to to enable Industry 4.0, then uh, we we are still lacking a, a, a very um, a strategic. Uh, actor player in 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 this uh, field so so the the agenda setting and the role of agenda setters that that governments uh, have uh, to play here are, are essential and we have seen the work uh, of rirs in the last decade um, in in all parts of the world i mean pushing i mean uh, the 
the demand. I mean, trying to generate and foster the demand <laughs> for IPv6, and uh, and we are still we we still have an imbalance, regardless of the fact that that uh, those numbers are growing and that we have very interesting and, and positive experiences. There are is uh, still scope for growth in in terms of uh, having a, a demand uh, and and not just being <laughs> pushing the, the demand constantly, which is something that, that, that we have seen and, and that it's a, a strategic role that IRRs uh, are playing in, in this respect. Another point is governments have to be adopters themselves <laughs> of this technology. I mean, there's this whole uh, thing about, oh, it's uh, the, the private sector driving it, and yes, but if the public administration is not even itself aware that uh, they have to be... Uh, um, the, the flagships of, of, the, of this development, and they have to have uh, in their own public administration IPv6 already, uh, and routers are accepting IPv6 uh, traffic, etc. I mean, it's just uh, p part of the of the whole um, idea of uh, being a, a role model and, and uh, adopting this this major role. And uh, the other uh, very significant roles that uh, governments have to play, uh, which um, some of my colleagues have already mentioned here, is uh, our training uh, and, and capacity building. The development of startup ecosystems, I mean, that is essential, and that is something that um, in the country where I live, in Argentina, so there is this ecosystem, uh, this uh, movement of uh, entrepreneurs around the traditional ISP sector, which want to engage with IoT, but they are asking for the government to develop clearer rules of the game in terms of uh, what will be the ecosystem and the regulation for them uh, if they embark in this kind of new business model for them as well, uh, which includes uh, IoT. So setting up this uh, ecosystem for startups uh, is, a, is another interesting role uh, for, for governments. Um, of course, uh, uh, standards, uh, standard setting efforts and, and uh, literacy on, on these uh, standards, the basic research, uh, promoting basic research on IPv6 uh, is also something that governments and through ministries of uh, education, universities, and, and uh, can also develop. And also thinking about maintaining an, an environment where competitiveness and openness is part of, of uh, a, a founding principle of, of this ecosystem. You know? I mean, if we don't have uh, openness uh, and, and competitiveness, then it, it will be difficult to think about interconnecting uh, smaller uh, uh, environments or smaller networks into the, the, the larger uh, network. So um, th these are the main points I wanted to share at this uh, first stage. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Carolina. So I take it that uh, uh, the German experience was successful because government was more a facilitator than than a mandated uh, imposer of uh, of IPv6 deployment. And uh, uh, we there's also cases in Argentina of uh, startups that are seeing lack of regulation as a chilling effect for uh, embarking on uh, IoT enterprises. So this is uh, all, uh, uh, w one more time an interesting mixture of how we see uh, one sector of uh, population needing some regulation while others are not really asking for regulation but for facilitation. So I would now uh, like to uh, hand the floor to Rajesh Sharia to uh, share his experience on IPv6. Rajesh. Thank you, Leon, <coughs> and the organizers for giving the opportunity. Good morning to all. India is always the late starter in any field, but when we start, we surpass everybody. The same was into the mobile. Initially, we were struggling how to deploy the mobile. And after a few years, we have surpassed 1 billion. Now we are the second largest after China. The same is in broadband. Our target was 750 million <coughs> by 2020. We have already touched 600 and 465 million till date. And we hope that one billion will be by 2020. The same story is with the IPv6. Initially, we were struggling how to deploy, how to put, and how to facilitate. Now, as Paul mentioned, we are the second largest in the world after Belgium, 51%. And thanks to our new operators, and even the old incumbent operators also, 
because when we have to meet the target, when the smart city project is there, IoT is there, M2M is there, we require the IP. In the absence of IPv4, the only remaining solution is the IPv6. And we started adopting that. Hardware manufacturers, software guys has supported us a lot and given this opportunity how to deploy. Reliance Geo, as Paul mentioned, is the one of the largest. And we have surpassed this IPv6 in la from last year only, 2016. And right now, around 88% uh, by the Geo, 34% by the idea, and the Vodafone is still on 23%. The good thing what our government is able to do, Carolina, thanks for putting this thing for the government. Our government come out with the roadmap on the IPv6. <coughs> Two roadmaps has come, and they never mandated to the private sector. What they have done, they have mandated to the government department that you all department has to be IPv6 enabled by the end of 2016, but somehow they have missed that target. Now the 2017 is the final given date. And they have also requested and advised all the operators to be IPv6 enable network, whether the demand is coming from the customer side or not, but your network should be IPv6 enable. And at the same time, they have advised to the Ministry of HRD Academia to put IPv6 as their curriculum into the net, uh, study course so that the new youth who are coming for the job or for the networking engineer, they should know what is IPv6 and how to deploy that. So this helps us in capacity building also. So this multi-purpose task taken by our government and the private sector in the true multi-stakeholder approach had helped us in deploying IPv6 in a good way. In 2012, India was awarded the NIR by APNIC in the name of IRENE. And as a director of NICSI, I was there to see the best international or best practice into the NIR into the Asian Pacific region. I must thanks to Akinori San. We visited Japan for getting experience about the NIR and he has helped us in such a way that India was able to build their own network of software of NIR successfully. And Mr. Akinori is saying, this is only due to you. You have guided us a lot. And the same was with Taiwan, Dr. Kyoi. He also arranged the visit of <coughs> IPv6 lab in Taiwan, which was used in day-to-day -day life in 2011, I'm talking of. When the Taiwan is in 2011, we are talking of the IPv6. We learned from them also. Now the requirements are coming of the IPv6 when general public or households are requiring the IP addresses for their home devices. <coughs> whether it's an air conditioner, whether it's a TV, whether it's a uh, oven, microwave oven. Slowly, slowly, the things have coming in the right way. And I hope that after the deployment of Bharat Broadband Network Limited by our government to connect 125,000 villages with the optical fiber to provide them the broadband services at their doorstep, we hope that very soon India will be number one into the IPv6 deployment and we will be successful in our slogan of connect the unconnected. So this is the story of IPv6 in India. IPv4 necessity is very important for a network. Few years back, I think in 2008, 7, 8, 
a proposal has come into the APNIC from the India side for allocation, for minimizing the allocation of IPv4 so that the exhaustion should be increased for a time so that the newcomer or the startup should also get some flavor of the IPv4 because right now IPv4, what we feel is the network and IPv6 slowly, slowly is going to take over this network. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Rajesh. This is uh, very refreshing, I think, because uh, you've told us that uh, an integrated ecosystem in a truly multi-stakeholder uh, way of doing things has been actually successful in achieving this rate of IPv6 deployment. And uh, we see another example of how the government, instead of mandating uh, the private sector to deploy IPv6, they instead mandated the public sector to, to adopt IPv6. So we, we cannot deny that the governments play an important role in IPv6 deployment, but we need to, f to find the formula, the right formula to have uh, a, a fruitful participation of governments rather than a, a, a directive uh, role or, uh, or a steering role from, from, from governments, from what I've heard from uh, all uh, my colleagues here in the panel. And uh, it also alliances with external players seem to have played a very important role in the deployment, like you mentioned uh, uh, the alliance with, uh, with Akinori and, uh, and Academia, uh, which seem to have uh, brought fruits uh, to your table. So, uh, I, uh, do, do you want to, to comment? Uh, you are right, Leon, that uh, government has played a good role. Even the, our association, ISPI, who I am chairing, we are doing SANOC from last seven, eight years regularly every year. And the main task of doing SANOG, and now from this year onward, 2018, we are going to do the INOG, where we are going to the tier two city for the capacity building so that the youth of that tier two city or the rural guy should be able to learn the networking, especially the IPv6 and security, which is the necessity for the broadband penetration. Thank you very much, uh, Rajesh. So uh, I, I think that we have remote participants and uh, I am not sure if there are questions from uh, remote participants, but uh, now we would like to break into groups so we can uh, further discuss uh, four main topics. And uh, these main topics would be the main pillars of IoT development, uh, the importance of IPv6 deployment for uh, the proper development of IoT. Uh, this will be one group. Uh, and I think uh, that Carolina and uh, Laura will be uh, uh, helping us in facilitating the discussion here. And then we have the successful experiences for IPv6 deployment and the future of IPv4 addresses, which uh, I think uh, Paul could help us in uh, facilitating the discussion. And I, uh, I guess Rajesh, you would be also uh, uh, very good in, in helping us with this. And of course, uh, Tanya, if you want to, to, to add yourself to this group. But I, I remain with uh, three, uh, three questions. It seems to me that this is some kind of an egg and chicken situation because uh, you don't have uh, IPv6 deployment because uh, the providers don't seem to have the incentives to invest in IPv6 equipment because they say that they don't have the demand. So it's like we're stuck in that. And uh, I also uh, have the question about uh, is it public policy uh, to force IPv6 deployment, the, the answer to, uh, to IPv6 deployment, or is it rather public policy that will create market incentives for IPv6 uh, deployment instead uh, the right path uh, to take? And I think that uh, many of these uh, issues have been uh, put in the table by our panelists. So now, uh, Kevin, uh, would you like uh, to uh, break into groups so we can discuss and uh, we could uh, discuss the topics for maybe 30 minutes, and uh, after that, uh, I would invite you to uh, give us your conclusions so we can share them to uh, all the groups. So let's let's break into groups. Yes, Kevin. Oh, 
Ok. Ok. Yeah, don't don't rush. <laughs> So we have until 10.15 to discuss, and after that we will uh, come back and share our conclusions. Hello. Those, those who are interested uh, in this corner, those who are interested in the V4, V6 uh, addressing issues, please, uh, please relocate and join us over here. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> 